Good evening, I'm Yochanan El Rom, and this is IBA News coming to you from Jerusalem. Israel is upset that for the first time a non-proliferation conference has been approved to discuss a Middle East free of nuclear weapons that singles out Israel and does not mention Iran. Even more worrisome for Jerusalem is that for the first time a U.S. administration has endorsed an NPT resolution that paves the way for that conference. Brian Freeman has more in this report. Of the, treaty. the Prime Minister's office reacted furiously to the UN call over the weekend for a nuclear-free Middle East that singled out Israel as a country whose facilities must be regulated but ignored Iran. Israel called the decision fundamentally wrong and hypocritical, which ignores the reality in the Middle East and the genuine threats looming in the region and the entire world. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, 189 signatory nations, called on Israel to join the treaty, which would oblige it to end its policy of nuclear ambiguity. According to international sources, Israel has nuclear weapons but does not acknowledge them. The NPT also called for an international conference in 2012 for Middle East free of nuclear weapons, as well as a special UN envoy on nuclear weapons in the region. The Prime Minister's office said that Israel will not comply with the decision, stressing that it is absurd that the UN decision focuses on the sole democracy in the Middle East and the only nation facing existential threats while not even mentioning Iran which openly breaches the treaty and declares its desire to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. The statement from the Prime Minister's office went on to say that the conference's decision diminishes rather than promotes security, declaring that the problem of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East does not lie with Israel, but with those countries that signed the NPT and then blatantly violated it while supporting terrorism. Iraq under Saddam Hussein, Libya, Syria, and Iran. Israel is particularly concerned that the United States, despite U.S. President Barack Obama strongly stating that he opposes singling out Israel, welcome the accord. Previous U.S. administrations had not allowed these decisions on a nuclear-free Middle East to advance this far. But Obama said after the NPT decision that there are balanced steps that will further the prevention of nuclear proliferation. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is expected to discuss the issue with Obama during their meeting this Tuesday. A senior Israeli official said Netanyahu will ask Obama for U.S. guarantees to block any practical measures, including an international conference on the issue. Israeli sources were extremely disappointed in the American behavior, saying the U.S. surrendered to pressure. The official said Israel had held intensive talks with the U.S. before the U.N. decision in an attempt to thwart the anti-Israel initiative, but the U.S. decided to go along with the international consensus and against Israeli interests. The U.S. did say after the NPT decision that it would not support an international conference on a nuclear weapons-free Mideast without coordinating with Israel. The U.S., however, agreed to the final draft of the resolution following a threat by the non-aligned states that unless the Egyptian initiative was accepted, they would veto any other draft and foil the conference. This is Brian Freeman for IBA News. Israel plans to deploy three submarines equipped with nuclear cruise missiles in the Persian Gulf. This according to today's Sunday Times of Britain. The newspaper claims that one submarine has already been dispatched to the Gulf as a deterrence against ballistic missiles developed by Iran that could be used to hit strategic sites within Israel. The Sunday Times reports that Israel planned to have a permanent naval presence near the Iranian coastline to gather intelligence and to facilitate the landing of Mossad agents inside Iran. The article quotes an Israeli naval commander saying the submarines constitute an underwater assault force that could be used if Iran continues its drive to develop a nuclear warhead. Missiles from the Israeli subs have a reported range of 1,500 kilometers and can hit any target inside Iran. Israeli warplanes launched a double airstrike early this morning targeting terrorist positions in the Gaza Strip. The Air Force attack followed the firing of two rockets into Israel on Saturday. The IDF issued a statement saying the raids were in response to rocket fire and the targets included the Gaza airport and weapons smuggling tunnels. This was the second night in a row that the Air Force was in action against terrorist positions. No injuries were reported in either instance. The international flotilla of ships carrying aid to Gaza has been delayed once again and is now expected to arrive off the coast tomorrow. 
Problems of seaworthiness have reduced the Gaza-bound flotilla from eight to five ships, which are slowly making their way across the Mediterranean Sea from Cyprus. Activists aboard the vessels announced today that they will not react violently if the ships are stopped by the Navy. Part of the delay was caused when Cypriot authorities refused to allow dozens of would-be passengers to embark in Cyprus. Cyprus also blocked potential passengers from using smaller boats to reach the flotilla in international waters. Authorities in Cyprus said their decision was based on protecting the island nation's vital interest, including economic ties with Israel. The Israeli Navy remains poised to prevent the Gaza blockade from being breached and still plans to divert the ships to the Ashdod port where the cargo will be examined and hundreds of pro-Palestinian foreign activists interned. Unfortunately, these people have rejected our proposal to transfer the humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip. They have exposed themselves. Their real agenda is not to help the people of Gaza. They want to support the authoritarian Hamas regime that on a daily basis violates the human rights of the people of the Gaza Strip. Hamas officials said six Palestinians were killed yesterday when a gas balloon exploded in a cross-border tunnel in Rafah used to smuggle goods into the Gaza Strip. The Rafah hospital added that 14 other tunnel workers were injured in the blast. Some are in critical condition. The United States and Israel have been pushing Egypt to do more and try to close those tunnels which provide Hamas with a lifeline, helping it to stay in power in Gaza. Weapons and other contraband regularly move through the underground passageways. In other news today, former Prime Minister Eyal Olmert spent the day at National Police Fraud Squad headquarters for his second interrogation on the Holy Land bribery scandal. Investigators reportedly presented Olmert with evidence implicating him in that scandal, focusing on his relationship with the main suspects. Last week, Olmert was questioned on suspicion of accepting bribes totaling over one million shekels from real estate developers to promote their interest in several projects, including the Holy Land apartment complex in Jerusalem. Joining me now in the studio to discuss Washington's support for the U.N. proposal, which calls for Israeli nuclear facilities to be open to inspection, is former Israeli Ambassador Yoram Ettinger. Ambassador Ettinger, thanks for coming in this evening. Prime Minister Netanyahu will be meeting with U.S. President Barack Obama Tuesday in the White House. Is he going to ask Mr. Obama for a clarification of the U.S. position? Well, it seems to me that when Netanyahu walks into the office, he will realize that the White House leopard does not change spots, only tactics. And uh, let the, the spots or the strategy has been very, very clear. It doesn't require any clarification because uh, President Obama from day one has stated he views the UN as the chief playmaker in international relations. He does not like unilateral U.S. policy action. He subordinates U.S. policy to the multinational consensus. And he doesn't believe in confrontation with rogue regimes. He believes in engagement with rogue regimes, hence the vote to uh, approve uh, the, uh, the decision to force Israel to open its uh, reactor to international inspection. Hence, I would say also the determination by Obama to treat Israel, in fact, as if it was a rogue regime and treat rogue regimes as if they are democracies. He has carried water for Abu Mazen trying to push Israel to the 67 lines repartition Jerusalem. And most recently, yesterday, he also carried Egypt's water. Egypt, for many, many years, has aspired to disarm Israel of its posture of uh, deterrence. And that's the essence of the decision which was uh, derived at last night. For the last few weeks, it seemed as though relations between Washington and Jerusalem were on the mend, warming somewhat under what some call the Mr. Obama's charm offensive. Is this action that the U.S. took with regard to the NPT resolution going to set things back now? Well, in fact, uh, there was no reason to assume that President Obama has changed his attitude. To his credit, he's an ideologue. He's not an opportunist. He's really, uh, he really intends 
to change the world according to his own belief, which I believe is detached from reality, is quite uh, naive, but he believes in, uh, in that. And, uh, and therefore, it, it is my, uh, my opinion that the issue at the White House is not going to be the peace process as far as Obama is concerned. As far as he is concerned, the issue is the November election. He has seen his numbers collapsing in recent months. He believes that playing it nicer towards Israel, he somehow would recover his numbers as far as Israel's friends in the U.S. I don't think this is a valid assumption, but apparently his advisors have induced him to invite Netanyahu. A senior unnamed Israeli official was quoted in Haaretz today as saying the uh, recent behavior by the U.S. is a surrender and a bowing to pressure. Is Obama bowing to pressure or is this Obama's policy? That's uh, Obama's policy, which in a way uh, does not uh, bow itself to pressure, but it subordinates itself to the common denominator of the UN membership, which is basically anti-American as well as anti-Israel, and therefore going along with that consensus at the UN and of the international community, President Obama has subordinated US national security as well as Israel's national security to the whims of rogue regimes. He has basically provided tailwind to Iran to advance its nuclear capability and has provided headwind to uh, global democracies such as Israel. We have just a few seconds left. Israel has explained to the Americans that preserving Israel's security is the most basic precondition for progress with the Palestinians in the peace process. Now, a senior official says this policy will be difficult for Israel to make concessions. Do you agree? Well, I think that anybody who examines the track record of the last 16 and a half years since Oslo Accords were, uh, was signed must conclude that it's time to change the disk, so to speak. So far, we have dug and dug and dug, and we, found our, we find ourselves now in a very deep hole. It's time to stop digging and get out of this hole. Ambassador Jorm Ettinger, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Returning now to the subject of the Nuclear Proliferation Conference decision, what was the intention of the United States in approving the accord, and then following that with objections? That's the question Ellie Wagelander put to Professor Gerald Steinberg, head of NGO Monitor and an expert on Israel's policy of nuclear ambiguity. I claim to be an expert. I'm an academic. I teach international relations. I'm supposed to know about the American administration. I was just there. I don't see any rational explanation for what happened. Either they are entirely, totally, completely confused, talking on both sides of their mouths. An administration that has made almost every possible mistake in the Middle East has now hit the third rail, the most sensitive issue, the nuclear ambiguity. For 40 years, it was quiet, didn't bother anybody. It came up and down politically, but nobody did anything. Iran is building nuclear weapons. The entire Middle East now is scared of the Iranian nuclear weapons. And what do they focus on? Israel and the United States shows no leadership at all in this process. So it, either they are simply incompetent or there is something going on which is extremely dangerous or maybe both. Okay, explain to me what kind of world are we living in where Iran is not even mentioned in this accord? We live in a highly politicized world and where the key issue is not the substance but the image. Look, we've got these group of, of, of radical pro-Hamas uh, supporters, people who were out in Arafat's compound supporting Arafat when he was uh, responsible for the terrorist campaign in 2002, 2003. These are some of the people on this, this boat trip from Ireland and others that are coming to help the people in Gaza to help Hamas. It's all about legitimacy. Israel is under attack from every different form, every different quarter in terms of legitimacy. The, the boat flotilla is legitimacy in terms of security against all of the rocket attacks and, and to try to get back Gilad Shalit. The nuclear issue is to attack Israel's legitimacy in trying to preserve its security in an environment which requires that kind of quiet deterrence of last resort that's worked so effectively for 40 years. It's an attack on legitimacy because frontal military attacks don't work. So what do you think is going to happen in 2012? I think we're going to see, I don't know if the Obama administration can learn. They say they've understood, the president says he understood he made mistakes. He hasn't learned anything from them, which is a disaster. Now, maybe they can learn in the next two years that this was a foolish 
concession by the United States. Maybe this was designed to say, okay, we're going to show engagement, Obama's favorite term. We're going to give the Egyptians something that they can run with, and now everybody's going to join us against Iran and against the Iranian nuclear weapons program. If that happens, you'll certainly come back and I will tell you I'm totally surprised. That almost never happens in international relations. Hasn't happened on Iran yet. The more likely case is the administration will say this is another mistake that we made. So yes, when the Egyptians demand the conference in 2012 and Israel says no, we're going to have another crisis. It's going to be made in Washington. So then when the inevitable pressure comes from President Obama on Israel, what will happen then? I'm not sure that's, that's it, that it is inevitable. One way or the other, either Egypt or Israel, either the Arab countries or Israel will be quite upset when we get to 2012 and, and this conference doesn't take place. Uh, but it, it will be, it, it'll be a different ballgame because then Iran will either have nuclear weapons and the NPT will become meaningless and there will be a regional nuclear arms race triggered not by Israel but by Iran. Or some sort of miracle will have happened. There will be a fundamental about face in American policy. Iran will be so stopped in its tracks. And then we can talk about other things. Prime Minister Netanyahu is going to meet with Obama this week. Obviously, this is going to be a topic of discussion. What's he going to say to him? I think at this stage, uh, unless there was some sort of secret game plan, which I find hard to believe on this issue, that relations are going to be so frayed. The Biden visit, Jerusalem, no surprises. Now, an American huge surprise. What's Obama going to say? Take out a chart of how a decision making is made and say, well, it wasn't really my fault. I didn't know about this. These sorts of explanations just don't make any sense. I, I certainly don't think it's going to be a very smooth meeting. There are too many issues on the table. And I think that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has an obligation to say to the President of the United States, even if I had wanted, or I did want to go with you, I wanted to take security risks, but now you've made it impossible. The family of Shai Abramov has suggested that foul play may be involved in his death in his prison cell over the weekend, and they've requested that an independent investigation be conducted. Police said that Abramov, the leader of a cult that allegedly abused children, hanged himself in his cell. Abramov was found hiding in a Haifa apartment last week and arrested by police who were acting on a tip. He was accused of ordering his followers to physically abuse their children, claiming the youngsters would be happier adults when they grew up. There's been a development in the case of the leaked mathematics matriculation exam. Police announced the arrest of two people for circulating questions from that test. The two have been identified as an education ministry employee and the headmaster of a private alternative school that prepares high school students for their matriculation exams. The questions had been placed on Facebook and news of their existence forced the Ministry of Education to replace the test at the last moment. The labor court in Haifa today began hearings on the civil suit for outstanding wages filed by Lillian Peretz, the former housekeeper of the Netanyahu family. Court President Rami Cohen pointed out inaccuracies in the suit filed by the complainant, but at the same time, Judge Cohen suggested that Sarah and Benjamin Netanyahu pay parts of the outstanding wages that are not disputed. The judge also recommended that the two sides submit to outside arbitration. After six years of research, Yad Vashem has just published the Encyclopedia of the Ghettos during the Holocaust, the two-volume groundbreaking edition which covers all 1,140 ghettos established by the Nazis in Europe, includes information on conditions, administration, leadership, and coping methodologies that have never before been gathered together into one encyclopedia. It includes 250 Photographs, 62 maps, essays, and a DVD of wartime footage of ghettos filmed in real time during the Shoah. A series of introductions explain the historical origins and the emergence of the ghettos, their characteristics and regional differences, as well as the sources and nature of the photographic material left behind. So it is the kind of encyclopedia that is, doesn't just give the name, it gives also a short history about a little bit about pre-war, during the war primarily, and even after the war, if people survived, if non-survivors, unfortunately. Like in our town, we were the only family that when we returned to the town, we were the only one. I was walking around in the town like on a cemetery. Here was my grandmother, here lived my uncle, here lived my aunt, here lived my friend. It built a, a new step in the knowledge of the phenomenon of the ghettos during the period of the Shoah, which is part of the infrastructure knowledge that we are building constantly. 
And this is a new step forward, a very comprehensive one, and from this perspective, it's very important. Israel's representative in the Eurovision Song Contest, Harel Scott, finished a respectable 14th out of 25 finalists last night in Oslo. Germany won the annual competition. Scott, who advanced from the semifinals on Thursday night, performed his emotional ballad, Milim, meaning words in Hebrew. His order of appearance in the finals was second to last of the 25 competitors in the finals. Before he went on stage, viewers were able to see a map of Israel, although without the West Bank. The decision to present the Israeli map was made after the Israeli foreign ministry protested following the semifinals that the map had not been shown before his performance, as was done with the respective map of every other contestant. In business news, Germany's largest bank, Deutsche Bank, has dumped its shares in Elbit Systems of Israel. The Israeli defense company provides technology for the security barrier being constructed in Judea and Samaria. Deutsche Bank succumbed to pressure from pro-Palestinian groups and announced that it had sold all of its 50,000 Elbit shares. The international positions for the prevention of nuclear war and Pax Christi, a Catholic group, have been waging a campaign to divest from Elbit. Defense is designed to prevent terrorist attacks on Israel that emanate from Palestinian controlled areas in the West Bank. Shares in Givot Olam oil company soared by more than 30 percent today after that company announced that oil had been detected in water flowing from the well. However, Givot Olam officials could not give a guarantee of just how much oil might be produced by its Megid 5 well near Rosh Ha'ayan. Let's look now at how blue chip and high tech shares fare today. Hot and getting hotter. IBA Weather Guy says Sharaf heat wave conditions will push into our region, bringing warmer than normal temperatures for this time of the year. Here are the highs and lows. That's all for today. I'm Yochanan El Rom. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening and shalom from Jerusalem.